All right, so I'm really excited today to have uh, Dr. Jamie Wagner join us for a conversation with uh, Kavu Dr. A. And I, I appreciate you being here. Um, you know, uh, beginning of the semester, it's a busy time, so uh, thanks for your time. I'm really excited to get to know you better. Uh, we, we operate and work in this uh, a similar field, actually, a very, you know, we, we work with the same data set pretty much. So I want to pick your brains, um, get to know more about what you're working on. And uh, one thing that I really want to have the opportunity to talk about is your role with NAI and especially the research uh, committee. And um, so I'm really excited for you being here. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm so excited to talk with you. I love your, I love all the shows and I loved all the prep work you did for this and how you posted on social media. It was wonderful. Um, so, you know, you've watched these uh, shows before and the conversations I have with uh, uh, economic educators. And, you know, I try not to introduce people because I think people have different layers. And when we get uh, into academic settings, we kind of go with the academic bio. So I want you to introduce yourself to the world the way you want the world to know you. Oh, man, so intimidating. Uh, well, I'm Jamie Wagner. Um, academically or professionally, I am an economics professor. I am also the director of the Center for Economic Education at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Uh, I'm an extremely passionate researcher, teacher, center director. Um, I think all that stuff is in incredibly important. And uh, my goal, and I think with along with you, is to make economics really applicable because economics is so, so valuable, but it's really intimidating. And so I, I guess I kind of pride myself that I'm really good at explaining economics in simple ways and in actually ways that are really fun. Um, in a kind of a non-professional setting, um, I am a wife. Uh, my husband, Colin, is amazing. He's incredibly supportive of my career. He even um, will join us on conferences or join me on conferences, especially if I have teeny babies that need to come with me. Um, so I'm incredibly, I'm incredibly thankful for the support. Um, he was with me. We, um, I met him in college. Um, I ran track there and he also ran track. So we met there and he's kind of been with me ever since. He was with me through grad school. And I'm sure you know how, how much support and everything you need through grad school. So that's wonderful. Um, and then I also have, I have a four-year-old daughter named Vela and a one-year-old son named Brooke, and they are ridiculous, hilarious, uh, time-consuming, as I think most parents can agree. Um, so those are, that's kind of my family. Oh, and I shouldn't forget, we have a puggle named Rogers, um, and I will get you a picture of him so you can put him on there. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and our, um, our family is incredibly active. Um, we live on a bike trail, so we regularly go out biking, and we are we kayak, we paddleboard. We um, it just snowed in Omaha um, uh, about like seven inches, and so we were able to snowshoe in the backyard. It was awesome. So we're definitely really active. Um, Colin and I just hiked a thirteen thousand foot mountain with wow. uh, one of uh, each of us had a kid on our back, and we just we just went. And it was I'm definitely excited to, to hear your perspective. And, you know, I, I like that you brought in the, the, the family component. Um, one, one thing that we neglect in our professional setting is to always talk about how support matters. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad to see that you highlighted that. And uh, I look forward to seeing all the pictures of the family and um, highlighting them. Um, oh, so be excited. So you are... Uh, you said you're a director uh, at the Center for Economic Education, and um, you've been in that capacity for how long now? What year is it? I think this is the this is my sixth year. Okay. I go up for tenure this year, so I so I should know that I started in 2015. Okay, so it's tenure year. Good luck. I'm sure it's going to be a smooth <laughs> sailing, um, but but yes, fingers crossed. Um, <laughs> so this is your first position out of uh, grad school. Yeah. This. Um, yeah. So I graduated in 2015 with my PhD, and I kind of just jumped right into academic life, um, being a, a assistant professor. And then I also started directing the Center for Economic Education. Um, I think I graduated on like May 4th or something, and my date of hire is was June 1st. Yeah. That's so a quick turnaround. Yeah. And 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 where did you go to grad school? I went to the University of Nebraska Lincoln. So, 
my whole grad school and actually my whole academic life is just a series of random events that somehow have combined into the most amazing journey that like I would have never thought I'd, I'd be here. So it's the whole from high school to now, it's a series of random events. Well, tell us about it. I mean, that is, that's what excites me about uh, these conversations is, you know, a couple of uh, uh, episodes back, I met with uh, uh, Rebecca Morrill, and she described her career as non-traditional. And the thing that I pointed out is every single uh, person that's been on, um, on the series has said the same thing. So I'm always intrigued by if we, we all have non-traditional paths, what's the traditional path, right? So tell us yeah, about your non-traditional path or your <laughs> random series. Where were you born? Let's start uh, there. I'm from Aurora, Colorado. It's a suburb of Denver. Um, in high school, I did the IB program, the International Baccalaureate program. So it's, it's okay. and, I, and I did AP classes. So it's it's super intense. And so when I graduated high school, I was just kind of burnt out of rigorous academics. Okay. Uh, I had a scholarship to run track at Hastings College. Um, and so I was very excited to go there. And I was like, cool, bachelor's degree, done, peace out. I'm going to go work yeah. and this will be great. Um, I had enough credits with the IB and AP stuff that I was actually like a like a second semester sophomore or something. And it's a liberal arts college and almost almost all my like random liberal arts credits were, um, I didn't have to take cause I, I had them from high school. Okay. Um, but I, so I went into college and I was gonna be a math major and I was gonna major in accounting. Um, and, all I, right. I, and then I took one accounting class and I was like, this isn't math. I thought, I thought accounting was math. It's not, it's organizing numbers. And if you mm -hmm. talk to accountants and you say something like, oh, you must be good at math. They go, no, no, I'm not. So it's really funny. There's that, like, there's kind of that dynamic. So part of liberal arts is you have to, you know, obviously take a lot of different classes. And I had to choose between taking an economics class or a poli sci class. And I was like, Ugh, both of them sound awful. I don't want to take either of them. But I was like, poli sci sounds way worse. I'm just going to take econ. That sounds less awful, <laughs> which is so funny. <laughs> so I, um, I took the class and it just clicked. Um, I didn't realize my entire life I'd been thinking like an economist. I just didn't, I just didn't know it. And so I, econ just, it was just awesome. I just loved it. So I was like, all right, I'm going to take another class. And um, I kept my math major and I was going to graduate um, a semester early. Okay. And I was going to graduate with a math degree and then an econ minor. And I was like, I don't want to do the econ major. I don't really care. <laughs> I know this is so funny that I'm saying this. As an econ Knowing where you are now. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, just wait. It gets, it gets, uh, I don't know worse, but it gets more ridiculous. So I was like, no, I'm graduating early. I don't care. And then I decided to stick around for my last year of track because track is the spring semester sport. And I was like, my mom would kill me if she knew I was one class shy of a major and I just chose not to do it. Like, you know, it wasn't even like, oh, it didn't fit into my schedule. It was like, I actively chose not to do it. So I did the major. Randomly, the summer before my um, before my senior year, I was at um, like a gathering with at my family's house, and my mom's overhearing this, which is probably the worst part. Um, and I'll send this to her, so she'll be really excited about this. Someone was asking me, you know, the traditional, "What are you going to do when you graduate?" And I was an actuarial. I was really planning to go on the actuarial path. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, "I'm, you know, studying for those tests, but they're, you know, they're really hard." And I was kind of wishy washy about what I want to do. And then I. I'm not even joking. I, this had never thought, had never even crossed my mind. But I go, maybe I'll go to grad school. I don't know. But I, I said it. <laughs> yeah, here I am. Yeah, just... but, so my mom, a couple weeks later, was like, are you really thinking about grad school? I was like, um, may, maybe. I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know. You know. So then I started studying for the GRE and I started applying at schools and I started applying for stuff. And um, one of my college professor was like, you're going to grad school, you know, are you going to do your PhD? And I was like, no, I am not doing my PhD. I'm just doing my master's. That's too much as it is. And he goes, well, you should really, um, 
make sure that you apply for the PhD program because that's where you'll have more opportunity for funding that you can never, like they can stop you from keep go, keep keeping on the track, right? If you're just a master's student, they can they cannot accept you for the PhD yeah. program, but they'll never be able to stop you from leaving if you want. So you could you could go into the PhD program planning to leave with a master's and that's fine. And that's what I intended to do. Okay. That's but but and, that's great and, from the advisor to give you that ad, uh, advice cuz uh yeah. there's a yeah, lot of people very that Yeah. Yeah. Good. So, so I did I uh, I went to Lincoln and I got, um, I had my, I had the funding and my fellowship and everything. And that was really wonderful. Um, and, um, I, like, I mean the first year of grad school, you know, you know how awful the first year of grad school yeah. is it's rough. It's like a whole nother level of rough. Um, I got a 32% on my first, um, microeconomics test. It's rough. Yeah. I still I, I think, think about it. I, I did maximize my costs subject to my profit. So, you know, so, that's so you deserved it. <laughs> Most definitely. Yeah. Sorry, Dr. Allgood. I really know how to do this. <laughs> uh, but so every step of the PhD process, I was kind of like, well, if I don't, you know, pass my, qu my qualifiers and that will just be the signal that, you know, I'm not meant for this. And then I passed my qualifiers and then I, you know, I was like, oh, well, if I don't pass my comps then that's just going to be like the signal that I, that's, you know, so it was like this yeah. continuous series. And the whole time I was in grad school, I was like, I don't want to be a researcher. I just want to go and I want to teach because that was really fun. And I loved the engagement of students. I was like, I don't want to go anywhere that has a research component. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and um, here I am through that whole random thing. I have a PhD. Yeah. I have a research component. I have a really strong research agenda. I love my research and I love my teaching. And I Who just have thought it, huh? it started off with that barbecue question, right? So whoever asked you that question about what the next step is, um, we need to thank them. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> So, Some days so, I don't know if I want to thank them, but I mean, I really just randomly said, oh, I'm, you know, I think I was just trying to get, you know, not have to explain. I was like, oh, maybe I'll go to yeah. grad school. Like, that, that the Throw it as a possibility, but, but yeah. knowing that you're and not even going to do my, it. Even my, ex, even my job at UNO is like a series of random events too. Like, it's just, it's an, it's amazing. Like how this just, I don't know, my whole like career fell in my lap. I mean, with, you know, hard work throughout the way, but yeah. like I... I, I was doing this preparing future faculty program at UNL mm -hmm. and the goal of it was that grad students don't really understand what faculty life is like, or if they do know what faculty life is like, they really only know from their institution. So I only know what a research one faculty life is like, exactly. but that's not where everyone intends to go. So the goal of the preparing future faculty was that you found a mentor at like a community college or a liberal arts college or, um, not a research one institution, someplace that maybe you want to explore more. And I, um, I have a wonderful advisor, Dr. Walstead, um, mm -hmm. and he is the, I call him like the godfather of econ ed. He and is. I did not, con I did not talk to him about doing this, which is fine, but I randomly emailed Mary Lynn Reiser and you know, Mary Lynn, who is just the best person on the face of this earth and it's so amazing. And I, I cold emailed her and I just said, Hey, I'm interested in econ ed. I just explained myself. And I said, would you be willing to be my mentor for this program? Um, you know, we'd have to meet like one or two times a semester. You might have to read like my teaching statement or something. You know, I hope it's not a huge thing. And of course she responds and goes, yes, like yeah. this is amazing. <laughs> and so it's just the best connection. She's still a dear friend of mine, but I, I mean, it was completely like random. And had I just asked my advisor, he probably would have given me the same advice same because care. he was, he, he helped hire Mary Lynn for her position <laughs> and I, or Jennifer, Jennifer Davidson. Yeah. I could have asked her, but I just randomly cold emailed this person. And it was the, another random event that has turned into the best thing ever. So and, and, and... where I'm at. It's it's a great story, and I, lo I love uh, how everything just naturally happened. Um, and obviously, you know, there's a, there's a lot of hard work that goes into this, uh, but there is also a luck component that sometimes we don't talk about. And 
um, you know, you're at a great place. Now, with respect to your position, did when you applied for the position and, and got it, was the center always part of it, or is this uh, something that you've added on since? So they changed the position, um, and you're right, it is kind of a little bit about luck, especially in academics, because mm -hmm. who knows who's retiring or who's hiring, and every year it could be a different, like a yeah. whole different ball game. Like, you know, graduating in certain years is, is a whole different thing. So Mary Lynn was, um, was her whole job was the center. So she was the center director. She did not have, she did not teach, she did not have a faculty position. And so they created the position that I had. They, they morphed like someone else's job with Mary Lynn's job. And part of it was, um, it was really smart because one, you know, it allowed me to teach and have faculty life there. But um, part of it was also a little bit of security. So if I was a tenure track faculty member and I got tenure, if the new dean were to come, if a dean were to come in and not really want the center yeah. or whatnot, that my job would still be protected as far as like my faculty job. So yeah. that's what they did. So they kind of, um, they, they were just, it was very forward thinking that it was unlikely to find someone like Mary Lynn and to make it a really long-term position, making it a faculty position was probably in their best interest. So the center was always part of that, part of the job description. Okay. And um, so and, and your dissertation falls in line with, with the duties of uh, the, the center. So I really want to dig a little bit deeper into your research. Uh, I find your research very uh, interesting, exciting, and um, I've benefited from reading your papers. So um, what is the project? I think the same that, about you. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, there's a lot of overlap in what we do. And, well, you know, one thing... Uh, that I hope that comes out of these conversations is maybe the opportunity for us to, to work together since there's a lot of overlap. Uh, but for the people that don't know your research, how would you summarize their, uh, your research interest? So most of my interest falls in, uh, I have kind of two-ish tracks. Um, one's, one is really looking at um, assessment and looking at the dis disaggregation of pre and post test data. Um, that's kind of been a smaller area that really started when I was in grad school. Um, and I don't, I haven't moved quite as far into that, but where I'm really passionate about and where uh, most of my focus is, is with financial literacy and really more so on financial, um, like financial education. So looking at the effectiveness of financial education, all with the hope of, um, you know, it helping practitioners or it guiding someone to find a more effective way to teach financial education for a better outcome all over. Um, and that's kind of where where most of my research falls. And, and what paper is uh, taking up most of your time right now? Right now, um, I kind of, so I have, I, last year, I, I was I was going on maternity leave in October, and in May I thought that was a good time to start two papers at the <laughs> same time. Yeah. And so <laughs> they're both kind of like taking up about equal time as far as that. And I'm um, I'm very fortunate enough to be working with my advisor again on that. So Dr. Walston and I are um, we kind of we work really well. So he's kind of heading one, and I'm heading the other, and we work together. But the two different papers are going to use the, they're using the newest um, national financial, or the financial Keep blanking on it. Yeah, the NFEC study. Mm -hmm. And um, one of them looks at how, how women are doing and how women, like female headed households are handling their financial decisions. Oh, and it really, important. yeah, so it really kind of that, the inspiration of that is my grandma. So my grandpa was phenomenal and just, I wish I had more time with him to really learn how he handled his finances. It's amazing, you know, what he did and the knowledge that he had, but it was, com it, you know, it's kind of that scary, complete traditional where he handled all of the money and my grandma didn't. And yeah. so when my grandpa passed away, you know, my grandma was really left in this world where she had no idea 
where, what was going on, how much money she had, where it was going, how to do those things. Luckily, you know, my dad is really financially savvy and my dad has been really, you know, key in helping her and doing all that. But so I just kind of, I was thinking about that. I was like, uh, women generally outlive men. Mm-hmm. Women also a lot of times bear, you know, this. if we're thinking about like single parenting, they generally bear more of the financial responsibilities of kids and de- um, dependents and things like that. And so I just started getting really worried about how are women doing and are they okay? Yeah. And that's where that paper is coming from. So looking at women in, and it's in joint households, um, but looking at women who are the financial decision makers in their families, how are they doing? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's really scary results and it's not, they're not doing well. And, you know, when we're thinking about a lot of these, you know, if we're looking at, you know, credit card behaviors and are they paying on their credit card in full on time or are they overcharging on their credit card, those sort of things, you know, that seems like a small problem, but we know that interest I mean, compound interest can either help or it can or it can really hurt you. So thinking long term of poor credit card decisions is really scary. And same thing with like retirement or wealth building. I mean, there's nothing you can do to go back from that. If you don't plan for retirement or you don't do those sort of things, you're that's it. You know, so we have to figure out something beforehand. And so that's that's kind of the one of the two papers that are the biggest one. Um, the other one, we're looking at how um, generations like the millennials and Gen Z are, the iGen, are yeah. handling their finances. And that's really interesting because Gen Z is probably really the first generation um, that had probably much more prominent formal financial education. Yeah. Um, you know, millennials still... I know we kind of lump all the millennials as just young people, but there is a difference. I am a millennial. So if you're born between like 80, mm-hmm. 80, 81, and I think like 92 or something, yeah, I, I think, think you're considered a millennial. Yeah. yeah. So, and then the iGen are kind of the college students now. Um, and so they're the first big generations that, or big groups of people that were really focusing on finance, like formal financial education. Um, Mm -hmm. Obviously, subsequent generations will feel this as well. But so kind of looking at at that. So those are the two, my two big studies right now. Yeah. So, you know, the the thing that you highlight is the fact that there there might be need for financial. you, You haven't said that, but there might be need for financial literacy education. We both work with centers where our mission is to increase economic uh, education and, you know, as a subset of economic education, I believe financial literacy education exists there. Uh, but, but in you know, I've been a center director now for five years as well, and I get pushback. I get pushback from some educators, and I get pushback from other economists that uh, the cost of providing financial literacy education is uh, much higher than the perceived benefit. Have you heard that argument? And if you have, what's your discussion around that? So I haven't heard that argument per se. Um, Most of the people that I surround myself with are very adamant about financial literacy education. but what I say to people when when I feel combated about with like financial literacy education, um, a lot of times it's just talking about how it's too complex that it's not that it's not a we don't it's too it's too hard for students. And so here's what I always say: I was like, could you imagine if for if math if if we just started with calculus? Could you imagine it? Like calculus is really complex. Like what if we just senior year just started teaching everyone calculus? Yeah. Like that just doesn't that just seem like absurd to you? Like, <laughs> what are we doing? So instead, what we do is we teach two year olds how to identify numbers and we start counting. Mm-hmm. Right. And then we start building into writing numbers. And then we start, you know, in elementary school, they start adding, they start subtracting, multiplying, dividing. Then they start algebra, geometry. You know, every single thing is this little bitty step towards the possibility of doing complex math. Mm-hmm. And the same approach needs to happen with 
finances and financial literacy. We shouldn't expect people to, you know, their first class to be like, well, if you don't know how to invest, I don't know what to help you with. You know, we need to start with identifying money, you know, counting money, Mm -hmm. just talking to them about, you know, financial literacy is really a big um, kind of off. I think it's just an arm of economic education. We start talking about choices, right? Are you going to, are you going to use your money to buy whatever toy it is when you're little, or can you save it up and buy something bigger, right? And then you start, you know, building those sort of things. We start looking at budgets. And so you can, if we were to do a better job of taking the baby steps throughout the person's entire life, it wouldn't be waking up to calculus their senior year. And that's what I, that's, that's my goal as center director to Mm -hmm. get people to understand that. Um, Fortunately in Nebraska, um, uh, econ and personal finance are in our state standards and our state standards are required to be taught. And so we do have economics and financial literacy that are required to be taught. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Now we don't have, you know, like a statewide mandate. We're a very local controlled state, but Mm -hmm. we expect our teachers to, to teach financial literacy and economic education, even in elementary grades. And so I'm very fortunate that, um, you know, our treasurer is very, very big on this. Um, and our, our governor is very big on it. And we have a really, a really strong community of people who really believe in it. So I do look forward to the day when I don't have to convince someone that, you know, financial education is important. I mean, no other subject do you really have to like no one tests the effectiveness of U.S. history education. You know, like yeah. when you're thinking about like the stuff that we do as researchers, like no one pre and post tests U.S. history and like, oh, well, they didn't learn a whole ton. So maybe we should not teach it. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, in every other subject that that seems absurd. But for some yeah. reason in econ and financial literacy, that's that's how we're at. <laughs> and, and the assumption always is if you introduce financial literacy or economic standards, then you must give up something else. And, you know, we're economists, there's always trade-offs, I understand that. But, but the, the, the question is, how do we weave it into what is already being done? Like math and financial literacy, um, to me, go hand in hand. Um, and, you know, just the question of trade-offs, right? And, uh, you know, um, I, I think personal finance, the basic foundations are trade-offs and opportunity cost. You get those, then you can start thinking about, you know, what do you do with your savings? And, and, you know, if I don't consume, I'm saving, then therefore, what do I do with it? And that starts the whole conversation. But but the assumption is you have to take away a class. And I, I don't know, if, if that's the battle that we're fighting, then, you know, financial literacy I don't, and economics will never get a fair uh, chance in, in, in education. Yeah, so I joke and tell my teachers that I will put out economics and personal finance are kind of like the veggies and I'll put the veggies in whatever class you want me to. If you want, if you're going to give me, if you're going to give me a PE class, I'll put some econ in that PE class. Um, But I think about, you know, even just with math, um, you know, students have to calculate the slope of a line. Mm -hmm. How about they calculate the slope of a production possibility frontier? Or how about they calculate the slope of a demand curve? You know, how about we do that sort of stuff? Or instead of, you know, having, you know, Joe have 15 watermelons, how about we do, you know, some revenue stuff in there? So there's some easy ways. I think uh, math is a really easy one to start doing some financial literacy. I mean, just talking about multiplication, division, you know, adding, subtracting, that's money all, all over it. Um, but, and then obviously I think, you know, in, in your history classes, um, I, I wasn't a big fan of history when I was in high school. And now that I'm kind of revisiting history through an economic lens, I am much more interested in those history topics. And so we can easily talk about the economics in the history classes. So and science, I mean, it's it's in all of them. So you I'll give you guys my email, but you send me your subject and I'll, I'll put it in there for you. <laughs> I, I like that challenge. We'll make sure to. <laughs> include your email address, and, and, and you do have a creative way of uh, bringing the veggies to, to the table, right? And um, uh, I am sure the educators in Nebraska through your center are, are benefiting a lot from that. Can we talk a little bit about the structure of um, your center? So uh, 
what I'm starting to realize is centers and councils around the states operate very differently. What's the setup in Nebraska? So we have the, um, well, we have, as of 2019, we had the 2019 best council, best state council. So we're yes, very proud do. of that. So how we operate is that there is a council and Jennifer Davidson, Dr. Jennifer Davidson, she's just recently got her PhD. We're so proud of her. Um, she runs the council and Jennifer is just, uh, I can't think of anyone more passionate about this stuff. And she is just so willing to support. So she really supports K through 12 initiatives across the state. We have um, five centers at, all at different universities. So there's a, one at University of Nebraska-Lincoln, which um, Dr. Tammy Fisher uh, is the center director. There is myself at UNO, University of Nebraska Omaha. There is um, Elise is at the University of Nebraska Kearney. And then we have um, Lindsay Docterman at Wayne State and then Gary Dusek at Shadron State. So we have five centers. And they really operate, um, we kind of, you know, we operate together, but we really, um, we kind of, we kind of divide and conquer. It's awesome. It's, we have a, we have a really, a really great group of people who are all super passionate. Um, and it's all, I think, really because of Jennifer, because she's so incredibly passionate and she's, she's like, a, I will find a way to do it. So I will come to her with crazy ideas and I'm like, hey, what do you think about doing this? And she'll be like, all right, let's do it. Um, and so she just kind of lets me run with stuff. I think the other night at 10 o'clock, I texted her and I said, hey, can I have this idea of doing a, uh, a book club? And um, if you, it's, it's, um, it's the, uh, so it sucks. It's a pretty, um, it's a, it's a, it has some uh, explicit language in there. So it is not for classroom use, not for classroom What's the name exercise. of the book again? Sorry. Socialism sucks. Uh, and it's two economists yeah. that drink their free drink their way through the free world. And so we're going to do a book club kind of surrounding that. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of misconceptions about what socialism and capitalism is. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we're really working. Last night, I just had a workshop, um, a virtual workshop where we really just defined what it is. And so helping students and helping teachers understand that. You know, we just we think of welfare benefits and those welfare programs as socialism. And that's, you know, you know, that's not what socialism yeah. is. Um, and so just really kind of building off that. So she, I text her. I said, hey, do you think I can do this book club? Do you think we could have the author um, do a presentation? And she said, yes. And so we're going to run with it. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, Bob Lawson's the author, right? I'm one of the authors on that. Yes, it's one I'm of the sure authors. He's I'm sure he would love to do the presentation, uh, but but you know, l let's uh, sing uh, Dr. Uh, Davidson's praises for for a second over here because uh, she has had a great influence on on me in, uh, as well. Um, I've been part. I was part of the NIE board. I just got done with my three year term, and I think you took my position, or the center position, and I've learned a lot. What is it? Sorry. I have big shoes to fill. Oh, thank you for saying that. But um, with respect to uh, Jennifer, she I learned a lot about leadership and managing change uh, from her. And, you know, they've done a really good job with the NIE um, membership and board and building it. So I'm really excited to see how NIE continues to grow. And, um, you know, it's, it's exciting times for, for NIE. Um, for, for those people that don't know, and I, I'm going to put myself on the spot over here, National Association of Economic Educators, correct? I got that right. Um, so let's talk about NIE a little bit. Um, so you are on the new board, and you also are part of the research committee, correct? So one thing that I'm trying to advocate for is people need to look into NIE as a source of, um, you know, uh, expert advice on economic education. Uh, what, what advice would you give somebody that's looking to get um, connected with NIE? What's the best way to go about it? How did you get connected to NIE? 
So I got connected to Nye through Jennifer Davidson. Um, so she helped me um, get connected with it. And, and now as my center director job, it's kind of just ingrained in my job. Um, I think I think the best thing is, is to check out our website. And there's a, uh, Derek D'Angelo did a wonderful, wonderful job of yes, revamping did. it. I think two or three years ago, it used to be kind of, you know, Websites are, are a beast to, you know, it's a full-time job to handle a website. And Derek really just, he made it super user-friendly. He really helped out with that. So I would say check out the website and look at, you know, what our, what we're about and our mission and see if that's something you're really interested. So NAI is really all about connecting the, the group of people who provide financial literacy and economic education. So it's a way for us to work together and to to we're we're better when we when we share ideas and we're better when we communicate that, and that's what Nai is all about. So it is a, it is, it is one of my favorite conferences, one of my favorite groups because it's just it's nothing but friends, you know, it's just nothing but su- like really fun people to be around who are also super passionate about economic education and financial literacy, but there's people there that are willing to help you, um, you know. Vi- I mean, everything. I, I think that there's always someone I could call and just bounce an idea about. Or if they're better at something, no one has any problems helping anyone else out. Um, I think we truly, as a network, um, we believe that there, it's not a zero-sum game of success. You know, it's not, well, Abdullah is doing really well in his center, so I can't do better in mine. It's how can we all make everyone else better? So. Um, success is not a zero sum game. And I think that that's what Nai, like, that's where Nai is so powerful is that we're better because of our network. And then, you know, I'll add to that. Um, a lot of people ask me like, Abdullah, how do you do all of these programs? Uh, the reality of it is it's through the Nai network, uh, access to resources, connecting me to, to a wider network of people that are willing to to support student projects and, and programs on campus and outreach programs. The, the other value added, this is really important for the people that are uh, working on um, research in economic education or financial literacy, and those are the organized sessions at the ASSA meetings and uh, our October meetings, and then we also have a meeting in the spring for anybody that um, is interested. And as I understand, we might be looking to organize some meetings at uh, CTRI as well. Yes, we sub- uh, uh, Diego submitted something for CTRI. So um, we're hoping that that gets accepted as well to, to kind of expand our reach. Yeah. So, so the goal is for anybody that's interested in K through 16 uh, economic and financial literacy education, check out NAI, great resource, great people. Um, I think my career, uh, I know my career has benefited greatly from the connections we've made. And uh, that's actually how you and I have met is uh, through the, the NAI uh, network. So one, one last thing I want to dig a little bit deeper on, and that is your teaching at uh, the, the college level. So is there a class that you always teach? So I teach, um, my, my passion and my comparative advantage, if we're going to go econ terms, is teaching yeah. the principal classes. So I teach principles of economics or principles of micro and principles of macro. Um, they are my all-time favorite classes. Um, you know, I, we don't brag enough about ourselves, so I'm going to brag a little bit about myself. Please. I'm really good at teaching principles. I'm really good at getting students to hear a, you know, you know, every time they, you know, when you tell someone your job, they go, oh, yeah. I hated econ. You know, I'd be a millionaire if I had like a quarter <laughs> every time I heard that. So my passion is making people not feel that way about econ. And I love when I hear students that they say, oh, their parents hated econ. And I'm like, well, I'm going to, you're going to love it. So yeah. um, that's my, that's what I love doing. Um, and it's my favorite. I, I, I really like, I really like the, the newbies. I like introducing the economic concepts and I like giving them the economic way of thinking. Um, and so my whole world kind of revolves around that. My research is on economic education and financial literacy. My center director job is, you know, I do workshops to teach teachers, you know, how to do what I do in the college classroom. 
And then I also teach the college students um, and it overlaps. I mean, my students will do all the activities that I do in my workshops. And yeah. I've done some middle school lessons in my college class and it doesn't matter. You know, um, if you've done the magic of markets, the dollar trade game with the foundation for teaching economics, um, it's really fun to do that for elementary all the way up to, you know, adults. And I will say bubbles are probably the most popular in elementary school and college. They love the bubbles. <laughs> so, so, so the same lesson or setup can be applied yep. throughout the age distribution. Um, mm -hmm. I assume, uh, the complexity of what the student's uh, process is going to be different across the age group, right? No, I think you'd be surprised, and maybe you're not because you deal with a lot of younger students too. I think um, most people would be surprised at how well our students do yeah. and how, how deep they can think about a lot of these concepts. You know, when I do the, the trade simulation, they understand how tariffs work. Um, maybe they don't quite have the language to say that's a tariff, but they absolutely can. And so it's phenomenal. Um, so my goal is that these students are really capable of talking like an economist. We just need to give them the, the language. You know, we need to help them. So we shouldn't we shouldn't shy away from using terms like opportunity cost just because they're kindergartners. Yeah, they'll learn it if we I mean, if we use the word and we train them, they will they will absolutely do it. So. You know, obviously some some answer some things are definitely not transferable or you know, lessons are definitely meant for other grades, but there's a lot of stuff there's a there's a lot of stuff that younger kids can do. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, that's, my four year old um, is learning about opportunity costs and she's learning about choices and consequences. So yeah. we're working and, and, on it. And I, I bet you're going to use that language. And then, uh, you know, I, I actually just taught my first class for the semester, uh, Principles of Macroeconomics. And uh, I don't know how it is uh, at your institution, but at NKU, macro is a sophomore level course. Um, and, and students come in really apprehensive and they're like, you know, they've heard all the, the stories. And uh, I tell them that it's really a, a, a course about learning a new language. They know it. They, they see it in their everyday life. They've heard the things. It's just developing the language so they could explain themselves uh, better and then analyze uh, the situations a little bit better. Um, but yeah, I, I love teaching principal level courses as well. It's um, you know one of my favorite uh, uh, courses. So we're in the spring semester. What, what does your summer usually look like? Are you one of those people that fully turns off on, on the summer and uh, kind of goes into research mode, or are you still doing the center duties uh, during the summer? So I, um, I read a book in grad school that kind of changed my research life and just kind of my whole productivity of life. And so I know a lot of faculty that say like, oh, I can't get any research done unless it's spring break or Christmas break or summer break. And um, I'm, I'm very much the opposite. I don't do work during those breaks. Um, I need those breaks. Um, I, do have, I do have work during the summer to do. Um, but I kind of operate that, you know, I've never missed a class and I'm sure you've never missed a class. And why don't you miss your class? Because it's on my schedule. Yeah. So I actually schedule research time um, at least, I have about nine to 10 hours a week of research time. Wow. And I'm very, I'm very protective of my research time. Um, I'm also very real realistic. So this week is the first week of classes. There was no research time on my agenda um, mm -hmm. because I'm not even gonna set myself up for something else coming in. This week is the first week of classes. You know how that is, like yeah. who knows what's going on. <laughs> Um, and so I set it and I, and I don't, um, there's only extenuating circumstances that can go in my research time. So if someone asks me to set up a meeting, my research time is not a time that we can meet unless it's a meeting about research. So gotcha. that is the time I read. That is the time I analyze data. That is the time where I, you know, proof or write anything that contributes to my research can be in that time. So there are instances where, you know, meetings can be at that. So yeah. um, I, I do that and I, I feel like I maintain productivity mm -hmm. um, and I feel very good about my research agenda. Um, UNO is very, um, is very research and teaching balanced in my opinion. So I'm not, um, 
I, I don't feel like I'm behind or, you know, anything like that with research. So my summers really, um, I kind of relax a little bit in my summers, to be honest. Um, not this past summer, but every prior summers, I would actually take every Friday off and I would spend the whole day with my daughter and we would have uh, mommy and Vela days. And she loves that. Um, and so I will probably do it again this year. Um, and I'm thinking I might take Thursdays off now and Fridays. So Thursdays maybe are like uh, broken mommy time and then Fridays become, you know, Bell and mommy time. So yeah. that's what I do. Um, but I also continue to support my teachers during the summer. So I have some presentations I do. I do workshops, especially, you know, in, Oct or in August, excuse me, you know, like the curriculum days that, you know, districts might need. I do those sort of things, but I, um, I, I enjoy my summers. Yeah. I, I, I work, but not, I, I definitely, I definitely take a little bit of a, I, I, I rein back a little bit. Well, well, that's, that's really great to hear. So a couple of weeks ago, somebody reached out to me and said, um, they wanted to, uh, have an episode on, uh, work productivity and workflow and, um, you know, asking how, how do you do what you do? And it got me reflecting and thinking that this year, so I went on sabbatical last year and I enjoyed it, uh, highly recommend it. But when I came back, I picked up some really bad habits. And the, the habits that I picked up was I said yes to every meeting and I stopped uh, calendar blocking my research time. So right now I'm trying to gain it back um, and, and it's difficult. Once you give it away, it's really hard to, to pull it back. Um, so my goal for the next couple of weeks is kind of get back to research blocking time, actually calendar blocking in general, because, um, one thing with the center this year, it's, uh, requiring a lot of, uh, random meetings that, uh, I hadn't anticipated. Oh, I don't know if you mentioned, what was the name of the book? Or if you don't, uh, have the name of the book, we'll, send it to me and we'll, we'll put it up on here because um, people love uh, these productivity books. Yeah, it's called Eat My Eat Your Frog or Eat My Frog, Eat Your Frog. Okay. It is, um, I'm not even joking, it is a game-changing book. It changed, it changed that like I can work less time and get more stuff done. So I am very, I mean, this could be a whole nother coffee with Dr. A about okay. my like my productivity. Um, I, I'm not saying I'm the best, but I have a pretty, I feel like I have a really good system. Um, I do about, so I teach two classes a semester. I publish two to three, maybe like, let's go two, two a year Impressive. on average. Um, and I do about 30 some events that equates to, um, since I've been at UNO, I have done the equivalent of 17 classes just in my center work. Um, like wow. the content hours. So um, I feel very, um, I feel. You've got a system. I feel very good about my productivity system. Yeah. And it's, um, I guess the, the, the main idea about eat your frog is if the worst thing you have to do today is eat a frog, get it over and done with. Gotcha. And then everything else is, is never that bad. And so you find the task that you really don't want to do and you do it, but you have to do it first because you have to do it when you have the most brain power. Gotcha. Um, a lot of times people kind of reverse it where they do their easy tasks first so they can just quick get some things checked off. But by the time you actually have to do something that requires brain power, you're shot. And so then you just push it off to the next the next day. And then you just kind of perpetually have this to-do list that doesn't get done. I'm also very particular on, I make realistic to-do lists. So. Oh man, we're going to get, in th do you have time I, for this? I, I'm enjoying this. We'll, we'll go on. This Let's one. go on. <laughs> but so we I might have... actually also want to think about another coffee with Dr. A about productivity, but give us, give us all the tips right now. <laughs> all right. So yeah. I, this is, <laughs> people are thinking I'm crazy, but I set yearly goals. I set okay. um, yearly goals. And then every month I have monthly goals and generally all the monthly goals have something to do with one of my yearly goals, right? Uh, maybe it's something with a paper that I need to get submitted and things like that. Um, or developing a course, you know, so I have monthly goals. Then every week I have weekly goals 
and all those weekly goals should accomplish something that comes that needs to be done in that month. And then every day has a task that needs to be done to to, to, to do that. Um, yeah. So I also kind of operate on the Pareto rule of you know the eighty twenty where you know eighty percent of your work comes from twenty percent of your tasks. You know those kind of that yeah. kind of rule. So I'm very you know I'm I try to be really particular on on what tasks I have to do that day. So I told you before we started this meeting that I had meetings from 8.30 till four o'clock today with an hour and 15 minute break. So on my to-do list, there is essentially no work that is getting done. Like, yeah. but that's how my, my job today is to do those meetings. That is my job. And so when I get done today, I'm not gonna say I didn't accomplish anything. Um, yeah. So I changed my mindset of like, no, you know, this coffee with Dr. A today, this was my job yeah. teaching my class. Uh, yes, I didn't get anything done during that for research, but that was my job. Um, and so I don't, I don't even, I, I don't, I guess, lie to myself. You know, I don't put down on today when I literally had an hour and 15 minutes, I don't put 16 different things. I don't even put anything that requires a ton of brain work. I do all the like, Today, if I had anything on my task, it was like very limited brain power because I just knew I wouldn't have time. Yeah. So I'm, so I plan my week that way of, you know, I really actually look at what is on my calendar and then I plan around that. So uh, I, I love that. I especially love the yearly goals and then monthly and then breaking it down uh, because it keeps you going. Um, and I think that's why most uh, New Year's resolutions don't actually get accomplished is because we just put that large a, a diaries that I can't. Okay, you, need yeah. a, you need a planner. Everyone yeah. needs a planner. <laughs> so, you know, I, I follow similar. I don't get to the weekly, but I do have monthly, uh, annual and monthly goals. And actually, my newsletter goes out tomorrow, the 15th of every month. And we're talking, I'm talking about how I set my goals. So I usually have a work goal. Um, work goals, financial goals, and then personal goals. And that's where I kind of uh, put the brakes on work-life balance. So I plan a trip or something of that sort. But I also have an annual theme, right? So that kind of allows me to put all my resources towards that theme. And this year, the theme is collaboration and hence this conversation, right? So it's, it's the thing that keeps me um, centered, I guess. But um, I, I really love the conversation. I, I got to know a lot more about you and uh, your path to where you are today. And I look forward to more discussions and in, engagement and a research paper together. If you could add it to your yearly goals, I would love that. I'll put on my goals. All right. We'll Thank you for we'll being here going. today. I really Thank appreciate you. it.